Good evening, folks. Welcome to the discussion. This is episode 258, and tonight we have Guru T. Kent Nelson, and I'm going to be bringing up now. So if you're tuning in, please tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button, and we're going to get started. I'm pretty excited about this. Um, we're going to look at his uh, FMA journey, what he's doing, what he's done, and then we're going to uh, just cover that and a few other things. So <clears throat> we're just jumping and getting started, and here he is. All right. Hey, how are you? Howdy. <laughs> Thanks for uh, agreeing to do this. You know, it's awesome. my pleasure. <laughs> so we're gonna try to we'll try to make it easy and painless. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're gonna jump into it. We got a bunch of cover. So obviously, you know, you had a martial arts background pre FMA. Just briefly, you know, what was it? Uh, I started Taekwondo when I was about seven years old. I did that for approximately seven years. And from there, I uh, <clears throat> found myself in a, a fight in school. I found myself in a fight in school. <laughs> and my, 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 uh, it, it left me with some information, which is that maybe I had a few gaps that need to be filled. Uh, mm. So I, I kind of moved on and, and I got into Japanese martial arts systems. I, I, I joined a school that uh, called Anderson's Karate. They did karate. They did uh, uh, Nihon Jiu Jitsu, uh, some, some, uh, Kenjutsu, some Ruku Kobu Jitsu. Uh, so basically karate and weapons and Japanese Jiu Jitsu and, and sword. And I did that for a long time. Really enjoyed that. Um, for, I did that for about three years. For whatever reasons, I wound up um, moving on and getting uh, connected with a friend of mine who's a kickboxer. And I worked with him for about 12 years. And uh, a lot of things kind of then all started happening like simultaneously. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, let's see, I think I was... Somewhere around the age of 16, a friend of mine was training Filipino martial arts. And we started, he started showing me stuff in parking lots and just having, having fun. At that time, you know, you just get your driver's license and, and you're like, let's go somewhere. And we would yeah. get in the car and go find a parking lot somewhere. And he'd show me how to swing sticks at my head. <laughs> you know, wow. and stuff like that. Okay. okay. Which is actually, interestingly enough, I didn't think about this till just now. That's a practice that I do. To this very day, I still will take a, take a student and throw him in the car and we'll go on a two hour drive and hit the beach at Lake Michigan or something and do some mm -hmm. FMA day or go find some woods or just find a, a nice yeah. spot to train. I, I still love it. So yeah, getting, kind of getting in touch in nature while simultaneously you're training. So um, what on? So we kind of got what led you there. But what? So, I mean, you're you know, you're training with your friend. It's kind of it sounds like it's kind of informal. What led you to actually seek somebody out, and who was that individual? Well, I was, I was really enjoying training with my buddy Josh, and uh, Josh Pitts was his name, and uh, I enjoyed that. But you know, he wasn't a, an instructor of it; he was a student mm -hmm. at a school, uh, and the school FMA was kind of a small part of what they did. It's not even like a like a large part, and I always played with it. Liked it, hung on to it. Um, see, if I recall, I think I started, I started taking uh, an Okinawan system uh, somewhere around th that early time period. And the instructor, his name is Charles Peterson. Uh, he actually had trained briefly with Remy Prisas. Okay. And so we kind of exchanged a couple of stick things he would show me here and there. And that, that reignited that fire and uh, eventually I met a local guy in town named Dan Smith and I did some, some artwork for Dan for his school. I did, uh, I went to school for art and, uh, I did, some, I did some logos and some paintings for him for his school. And, and he exchanged some, some, uh, private training for FMA with me. And I picked up a few more things and I eventually that led to me kind of helping teach at his school and his FMA classes, which got me a lot of reps. And then one day he says, uh, I'm going to go do this seminar with this, Guru Dan and Asano guy, would you, would you like, would you, yeah, yeah, that, that's almost exactly what I said. <laughs> I was like, hmm, don't know him. Is he any good? You know, but, uh, and he says, says, well, yeah, I was one of Bruce Lee's top students. And of course, you know, I responded like everybody else. I was like, oh, not really Bruce Lee guy. <laughs> you know, I just had no idea. Right, I was right. just having fun training and, and doing, I was really heavy into the Okinawan and Japanese systems at that time. And, uh, I really enjoyed the stick work. It was fun. It was fluid. It was very different than other stuff. 
And so I said, sure. I was his training partner. I went down and, and, and saw Guru Dan. I think we, I think we did that with him. And also I think him and I went down and trained with Bill McGrath too at one point. Oh, okay. um, and, and, uh, I mean, it, it was like, oh my gosh, what, what, yeah. I've literally just been tinkering around with something that's so much bigger. So much and, more vast. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, and, and, uh, and of course when we talk about, say Guru Dan, I mean, just the FMA component is vast. Mm-hmm. But when you start to get into the into the JKD component, we start mm-hmm. to have the quiet martial art component. That there's just so, so much. So anyways, I knew at that point, uh, this is a person that I'm going to follow until mm-hmm. he's no longer followable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what I've worked on. You know, like uh, I was doing a one point three to five seminars a year and, and yeah. traveling out to the academy and um, – for the most part, I will say that a lot of my Inasano Kali, which I've been with him for 22 years, wow. a, lot, a lot of what I do, I find now is very different than a lot of the other people will have similar feels. But, you know, I kind of came from that group of students where I, I didn't have Guru Dan to train with every day. Correct. So I would go, I'd, I'd do the seminars and take every note I could take my seminar partners, whoever came with me and we would come back and we would just work the stuff in my garage in the backyard every night. We would, we would work on it and we would figure out how to make it work and we would learn how to own the material. Maybe we weren't doing it exactly like guru was, but we found value for ourselves in it. Which yeah. eventually started the process of leading to, you know, the curriculum I'm teaching now, but, but that process was so valuable to me to be able to, uh, Maybe not have somebody looming over my shoulder, but to, to have to get in there and, and dig the knowledge out for myself. And something okay. I've definitely seen over the years is you see people you see people that get to see him every single day yeah. that, that still struggle with the knowledge. And I think part of that is that you, you might even take it for granted, you know. And I'm not saying everybody does, but I no, think no, 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 no. But I you brought something interesting. Good. You know, I look at it as like generations. You know, like the decades. Like what was stressed in that decade. Like yeah. one of my teachers, Burton Richardson, was you know, was way there in the beginning. So what was stressed back then, you know, um, as far as you know what he what you know currently Guru Dan was training in and all that, or what he was learning at that time, is kind of per Burton. Sometimes that was kind of the theme, so to speak, like what he was teaching. And yeah. obviously, as the decades went on, you know what I mean. You know, obviously the the uh, curriculum. And what is the blend? I mean, actually, uh, you know, grew and all that. So when you, um, when you met, I mean, like, so would you, you know, because coming from the traditional background, you know, with the traditional weapons, Tomfa, for example, or, or what have you, like, you know, what was the immediate far as differences compare and contrast to now doing FMA weapons? Like, what, what stood out? Well, I, I actually still do Kobido. Mm-hmm. And FMA. I do Okinawan weaponry and Filipino weaponry. Um, and, you know, I just like there's massive differences within Filipino weaponry, there's mm-hmm. massive differences within in Okinawan weaponry, too, in the way it's looked at. So, like, it's it'd be disingenuous to, like, give, well, this is the difference from that. Because right. that's not entirely true. What I will say is very different. Um, and one thing you'll notice right away in – the more traditional Kobido systems, despite whether it's a system that focuses on leverage and locking or a system that focuses on striking, you know, one of the primary components that comes from that culture is some sort of solo, like organized solo form training, like some sort of mm-hmm. kata. Um, and there are positive and negative aspects to that. And that's a whole different thing, you know, a whole different argument people love to have. Um, but when you look at the Filipino martial arts, I think one of the things I enjoyed the most was that, uh, you know, you get into the contact right away. And, you know, I actually didn't get into solo training with, I didn't know that's what I was doing. Like the term Carenza came years down the road. I was just. Funny you bring that up because it's with me too. What's that? It's funny you bring that up because what I, I couldn't stand doing it. I felt stupid. I felt funny. And then finally I just said, look, man, you, you gotta, like, you gotta try to do this. You gotta try to at least attempt it. And I was a late bloomer in that. Well, I got, I, Carenza was always something I did, but not something I pushed super hard with my own students. Mm. Um, Cause I think that, you know, I, I had a luxury 
uh, which was I went 20 years with training partners. Mm. And then 2020 hits, and I have no training partners. <laughs> and all of a sudden, uh, I'm writing I'm writing huge documents on on how to teach Carenza, like how to break it down and add this to that and, and put this in here and here's this footwork mm. this pattern and connect it this way and and um, and what that did because all of a sudden when I could start teaching again, you know, we could we couldn't have contact and everybody had to be ten mm. feet apart or whatever. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So the first six months, I was teaching Carenza and how to help people find their flow, how to help them find their movement. Yeah. And, and I, I now see those students that are still around from that time period, their movement is so much better and they have progressed so much faster than other people have. And I, I really, truly recognize its benefit. Um, I will also say, though, I do recognize the benefit of, of now of, of pre preset patterns, whether you're talking about a kata or a juru or even one that you, even a flow, a set flow you put together with a weapon. Like freestyle has its place, that self-expression, you need that. But also if there's a movement that you're trying to refine, uh, a, a body mechanic that you're trying to refine, uh, whatever it might be, you, you got to pick up the weapon and do it. And having some sort of a, some sort of a repeatable pattern is helpful. But, you know, people get lost in that. They get stuck in that. And they think that's the art, you know, but, but, uh, it's a big you know, problem today, I think you know? it is. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I like Kata and Carenza, you know, because mm -hmm. it teaches you Kata forces you to look at certain things you wouldn't normally look at with yourself. And Carenza allows you to bring out the flow and the feel that, and it removes yeah. the restriction that Kata gives you. Yeah. So, well said yeah. under restriction. Right. Yeah. Like you're not, you're not bound by a pattern. I mean, you're able just to, uh, you, you know, when Mike Karenza really improved and, and KI, we call it Amara, uh, kind of same thing is, uh, when COVID kicked in, I was like, well, no time then better. I mean, obviously I'm not meeting with people and all that. So, and, um, you know, I did it before that. I'm not saying like, you know, I didn't do it before, but where I really started to accelerate in it, become more comfortable in it, became more in tune and, you know, just me and let it just come out. COVID. Yep. <laughs> yep. You know, COVID, COVID changed. Uh, a lot of the ways I see things, a lot of the ways I look at things. One hundred percent. I I went back to an old teacher of mine I hadn't trained with in twenty years. And I got and I, I got my black belt from him. <laughs> you know, just because like, well, what are arts that I can do by myself? You yeah. know, and so I went back to to the Kobudo teaching. You know, yeah. and 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 uh, have really enjoyed what I've got from that. But it also has shined a light on my FMA simultaneously, and mm -hmm. um, I think my FMA is stronger now because of it. In all honesty. Oh, wow. No, I can't argue that. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously a terrible situation, COVID and all that, but you know, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, depending on what how you look at it, I mean, there were some good things that came out of it. Like I see through FMA discussion, I actually saw the cross training because obviously, I mean, Zoom went through the roof, you yeah. know, not just, not just, you know, teaching classes, but seminars and guys and people crossing lanes that perhaps COVID wasn't around, they perhaps wouldn't have done it. So I think there was definitely some benefits to it, you oh, yeah. know, um, Most definitely. you know, all that. Um, so when you, um, okay. So, so Guru Dan, you know, cause I, I know you've got a few teachers, but let, let's, um, let's talk about that guy called Guru Dan. Okay. <laughs> You're going to get so, me in trouble, aren't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so just, you know, obviously you as you mentioned, you know, 20 years tenure with him. So, I mean, like, you know, just tell us about, you know, so kind of multi-part question, you know, tell us about the teacher and what has he done far as instilling in you and your journey? Okay. I can't, I've been told I can kind of trail off. So you might have to like push me back on the path of the question. Okay, no, all right. No worries. I'm a seasoned veteran here. So <laughs> My students right now that are watching are all going, yeah, he will trail off. So keep an eye on him. Um, so, so Guru Dan, because um, that was like a multiple part question. So what has he instilled in me? Well, first of all, tell us, tell us about the teacher. I mean, like, I mean, okay, you know, those, I mean, obviously 
many are from you know obviously the majority if not all the community definitely is aware of him and his contribution to fma and you know spreading it out in the western civilization you know western hemisphere yeah. but far as like him as a teacher and and all that you know well okay so i would i would preface this by saying whether or not someone is considered a good or a bad teacher is usually dependent on the learning style of the person saying it. Mm. Right. So if you are a visual learner and a guy comes up and just explains everything to you and doesn't say anything, and walks away, you're going to be like, God, that guy's a sucky teacher. Right. At the same time, if you know, like, like if, if let's say you're a kinesthetic learner and the guy comes right up and says, here, do it this way, puts his hands on you, get to feel it. And you, and you, you receive the message exactly as or you get the message just in the way that you, you receive it. You know, like that's your language. Um, all of a sudden the guy's a great teacher. So I'm, I'm going to preface it with that. And I'll just talk about uh, how Guru Dan kind of has been with me. Because uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't speak for anybody else's journey. Sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely towards you, sure. Now that we got all that out of the way, right? <laughs> the reality of it is, is that uh, uh, he's different now than he was 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, uh, he was 64 years old when I met him, right. 85 now. Um, at 64 years old, he was absolutely the fastest person in the room. And there was no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, in that time period, learning was, was actually quite, quite difficult because uh, for me going in, you know, when Guru teaches, he likes to teach – uh, well, actually, have you have you ever worked with Rudan? Closest was Larry Hartzell, but Don okay. Rudan. So very typical Guru Dan seminar. You go in, and Guru will say, "Okay, I just want you to do this one little thing," and he's going to show you five to ten things, yeah, and then he'll perfect. say, "Then he'll say, just do these five to ten basics. I'll give you what do you say a minute, minute and a half, and that's what he means too." And and the what happens. When you're first exposed to that, yeah. you try to memorize everything. Yeah. And what you get from it is that much, right? No, you get to I, that's why I mean, Larry Hartzell. Like, so, I was trying to take notes. Yeah. That was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> well, well, what you discover with Guru Dan is two things in this process. Number one, he's teaching to, and he's, he even says it, there's, there's everybody in the room from kindergarten to college level. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to, teach to all those levels. So when he gives you 10 options, he's not expecting you to get all 10. Right. He's trying to teach to 10 different levels in the room. And what you're supposed to do is pick the one or two that are appropriate to you, spend that minute and a half working it. So you kind of get the idea, maybe take a note if you need to, but you mm -hmm. can feel the essence so you can go home and work it. But if you try to come home with every – it's like trying to order every dish on the menu. Your table isn't big enough to fit it all on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? No, well said, but good analogy. Yeah. yeah. So so really the Guru Dan seminars I think are – I think you get the most benefit, number one, when you attend them over a long period of time. So I could go to a seminar five times in a, five times in a year, five different seminars. 80% of the material would be exactly the same, but I will understand it so much better, especially if I do those same five seminars three years in a row. Okay. Because, because like, although the material being presented is 80% the same, I didn't catch 80% of the material. Right. I caught 5% of the material. And the next time I catch another 5%. Mm -hmm. And it's so much easier to learn that way if you think, okay, I'm going to go home with a small bite and then go home and chew on that small bite for a long time, okay. right? So next time, okay. okay. Exactly, but I think most people, most people have, um, I watch what I call the entertainment factor. So they'll go to a guru dance seminar and they watch guru and I'm telling you, it's entertaining. You, you do Filipino martial arts, you see guys that are doing what, the, what they do like mm. to the top of the, oh, and it's just fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that people get mesmerized by that. You know, I would they, definitely agree with that. Yeah, yeah and they and they miss the lessons that are being sprinkled in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. You know, um, so that's I would say that about Guru that he, you know, when I first started, he was very, very fast and good luck to you. And, you know, um now that was different once I became an instructor and I could start coming to the instructor camps at the academy and I got to actually spend, you know, four days at a time with him instead of just four hours at a time with him. Mm. Going out to the academy and, and being in the classes as well. 
make a difference because uh, you're able to ask more. You got you able to ask more questions. You're able to ask him to expound upon things. He's he's definitely much more comfortable. He's in his not that he never looks comfortable, but he's he's at home. You know, he slept in his own bed the night before. He had he had dinner at home instead yeah, of yeah, right beyond Tulsa, you know, Oklahoma or something, right? Yeah, so you, yeah, you get a different a different energy, a different charge, yeah. you know. And maybe I'm the only one that picks up on that. I'm I'm sure I'm not. No, it makes sense though. That's mm -hmm. what I, you know. Um, now at, at, in his 80s, uh, it's funny now. Like I can, you know, I get my students to go to the seminars and uh, and and. And he'll show one or two concepts and he'll like break down little details and things like that, that we never got to see when he was in his 60s. At least I did. Like, yeah. He didn't, he, he didn't break down the details as much. And now I think he's really focused on making sure that he wants people that like, he knows like, you know, this, this is an art that like, when I move on, I leave what I leave. So I want to mm -hmm. make sure I, I, I teach the people right. And so he, I think he's really making sure now that he gets a lot of those, those lessons layered in more, but that's the feel that I get from it. I feel like he's slowing down and giving more details now. Makes sense, though, you know, he's getting older in his twilight years and he's wants to leave, you know, and obviously not his legacy speaks for itself, but he, he probably wants to make sure that people are really getting this as before do at a younger age. He, it was more on the physical quality of things. I, I could definitely, I could definitely see how that evolved, you know, well, I think, I think, you know, when you talk about legacy, I think a lot of people think about legacy as far as like, I want to make sure there's lots of video of me out there looking really cool. Mm. Or I want people to talk about how awesome I was. And uh, I can say for sure with Guru's legacy, and I think this is one of the best lessons I've ever learned, his real legacy to him is the quality of the students and like how well he was able to help their lives and give them a tool for them to be able to help their own lives and help their family's lives. And, mm -hmm. and that is, I really think that that's Guru's legacy is a, a legacy of love that's taught through martial arts, not a legacy of different ways to kick some butt. No, yeah, yeah. And I, no, I definitely see that. I mean, just from what Guru Burton has shared with me and all that, I mean, he, he's touched upon that too. And, uh, He's also, you know, he also touched upon me. It's up to the student to extract and take from it. Yes. You know, he, he's giving you the pieces. It's up to you to do what you're going to do with it. Yes. Know? And I think, I think it's really common as Westerners. I think it's really common. We expect to be spoon, uh, spoon fed the mm -hmm. material because girl won't spoon feed it. Like, here you go. Pick it up. If you don't get it. We'll cycle around in 10 years. We'll get to <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We'll, you'll see it, we'll you'll, get back to it. You'll see it again in 10 years. Well, but that's true. I mean, he, you know, he really teaches in these cycles that in the beginning, I for years I was lost. I was like, I don't understand. Like, this is and so I remember somebody saying to me, Oh yeah, we covered this back in 1981. I was like, 81. I would, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and sure enough, you you know, he he thinks in terms of years. He thinks in terms of five, 10, 15, or at least it seems like he does Yeah. And those, those, because he'll get on a subject and he'll stay on that subject for a long time. And you'd be like, remember when we used to do this and that and the other thing. And then one day he'll pull something out and you're like, Oh my God, I forgot about that. And then you, that might be the theme for the next year. You have no idea. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. I mean, I just, yeah. I, I mean, the only thing I can, I, and again, the only thing I can relate to as far as, the seminar format, you know, seeing him and all that is just my time, like going to a couple of Larry's heart cells when he used to come to Connecticut and just being, and I fully admit this being 100% completely lost. <laughs> I just was lost. I mean, it just, and this, I mean, I'm talking, oh gosh, this is probably, yeah, I mean, like, uh, maybe close to 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, and just yeah. like lost, I mean, like trying to, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I was green, you know what I mean? I, I just, <laughs> it just, I was a mess. <laughs> well, I think that, um, I think there's a lot of people, uh, I, I most, I'm sorry. I most definitely was one of these people in the beginning, um, that, you know, you see, you see this man doing these things and he inspires you and you, and you yeah. learn from him. Right. And you want to emulate those things. 
And mm -hmm. that's the example of what it looks like. So you get a lot of people that will start teaching seminars or in my case, I was asked to come in and teach seminars. That's how I got started. But, um, but I, uh, I, I can go back and look at those videos myself and see myself just a thousand miles an hour teaching everything I possibly know, because that's what good is. Right. Or at that time, what you think good is, you know? Co yes, correct. And you know, I've since learned like, I mean, 20 years later, I have my own seminar style now, my own teaching style now, whatever. And I've, I've, I've tried to learn from my students say, okay, the, I'm not Guru Dan. So trying to teach like Guru Dan is, is yeah. maybe not the way I should be going about it. Now I can, I can take little bits and pieces, you know, that, yeah. that, that, that I understand. Uh, but ultimately I got to find my flow. I got to find the way I communicate. I got to find the way I teach. And that's really what Guru has been trying to teach for years is to tell people you got to find you. Yes. yes. You know, like, like the term in Asano Kali, that's the student's term. We call it in Asano Kali. He doesn't call it in Asano. I've never heard him say in Asano Kali. Why, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. Dwight Woods touch on that. Like, like he was like, what blend? Yeah, like, all, my, <laughs> all my instructor certificates all yeah. say the same thing. They say Filipino martial arts. Filipino martial arts. No, right. Yeah. Now, I've heard yeah. that from more than one person. It's like. Right, the students created that. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. We out of out of respect, I I you know I'll say oh this is in Asano Kali specifically so they mm. they understand like where it's coming from because you know I understand where he was coming from and calling it Filipino martial arts and trying yeah. not to not not want to upset any groups. I believe it was his father actually that told him to refer to it as Filipino martial arts, um, but mm. that way you don't upset the different groups. Yeah, I know. Understood. I mean, he was in a predicament. I mean, yeah. yeah. But, you know, like, to me, I use the term FMA, but I, if something, if, if there's something that I learned specifically from the Inasano lineage, mm. I, I it, well, I always in general try to share what lineage I learned something from when I teach it anyways. Right. I, I think that's a good habit to get into. Um, you know, we talk about the different FMA systems that are going to fade out and die in time. And I think that one of the reasons why is because we get so focused on making sure we teach the physical aspects, but mm -hmm. not all of us are really good at teaching the, uh, the historical context and things like that. And, and I think we need to keep that up. And I think, I think, you know, and I know this, we're not trying to make this the Guru Dan show, but honestly, Guru Dan is the person that, that, that really gets big into like teaching the histories and teaching the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the stories and teaching the, you know, the, the, the why and the how and how do we get here and, and this culture did it this way and that way and that has done more in my opinion to make people go oh oh this is this is not just filipino this is this tribe and this group and that group and right this, right this people and, and the next thing you know it, it becomes more opening to all people that way mm. it accepting it might be filipino martial arts but it's really he found a way to open it up to all cultures and make all cultures feel welcome by yeah, yeah. talking about the histories. And I would hate for us to lose that. No, no. I mean, he, I mean, just, I mean, honestly, besides just being so prolific, I mean, incredibly instrumental as far as the spreading of the art in the Western hemisphere. I mean, America, Europe, I mean, just, I mean, he's, you know, yeah. I mean, just, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, I can't think of anybody else. You know, I mean, you know, Rem, you know, obviously Jim Remy came here, got into traditional schools. Obviously, you know, he, you know, obviously deserves extreme credit for that. But if you look at globally, though, globally, I mean, you know, what I mean, <laughs> that's, I think it's unprecedented. You know, what I mean, like, oh, it is. Yeah. And he and he hasn't just done that with FMA. I mean, he's right. done it with C lot. You know, and look, look at, look at all the amazing martial artists that like he kind of introduced them to everybody else. No, I, mean, I know. I learned about Arjun Chai through Guru Dan. I learned about Francis Wong mm. through Guru yeah. Dan. I learned about Machado through Guru Dan. I, I learned know. about Paulson through Guru Dan. I learned about Pridel Suri and Omri Bam through Guru Dan. Like so many people. <laughs> I know. I mean, when he was bringing them in there, I mean, just and again, just to parallel off what you're saying, piggyback. I mean, you know, the Guru. Uh, you know, Burton has told me the same thing. Like, you, 
you know, you just couldn't believe the people he was bringing in back in the day. And it just was like, you know, um, yeah, just incredible. Like, you know, those, you know, just the exposure, like he's created for those folks. If I'm not mistaken, I mean, he really brought, I mean, he's, he's kind of responsible for Thai boxing taking off in the country, right? If I'm not mistaken. Well, I wasn't there, yeah. but, but from, from what I hear, yes, is that, uh, you know, he, he kind of, he used his platform to kind of introduce master chai and mm. at a certain point i know i know that guru eventually said that he wanted all his um all his students to take their 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 muay thai test through chai um so they actually like you have to go through him to to get that certification right. um but uh but yeah he he launched that and well like i said there's just a ton of names and the funny oh, part I know, is, no, I know. Like, we we all benefit so much from the doors that he's opened that most people have no ideas about. Yeah. They have no yeah. clue that, oh, well, you're only studying this today because a guy 30 years ago named Dan Inasano. Exactly. No, no. Know, no. That took off. No, that's that's absolute truth. I mean, yeah, that's not to say it wouldn't have come around, but nowhere in the time frame it did. You know what I mean? Or there's just no way. Yeah. We got folks jumping in here, folks. Yes, if you're watching, tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button. We got Terry from Stockton, Andros, Frank, Drew, Patrick. All right. So who else? Hey, I know that Drew guy. <laughs> you know, oh, he's one. Of, he's one of yours, huh? <laughs> yeah, Drew's actually Drew's actually a pretty dedicated student. He does um. He does probably a, a, a probably an average three to four hours of private lessons a week, and we were we were we were shut down in the pandemic. Um, he was doing private lessons continuously, just him and I. And actually, he helped me rewrite my entire jujitsu curriculum just oh, by wow. be, just by beating his body up for lots of time. <laughs> Jeez, so, so thank you, buddy. I appreciate it, man. Do you know Benjamin? We got Benjamin. Yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. Actually. Uh, uh, Ben's been doing private lessons with me three times a uh, uh, three times a week since the pandemic started. He got one wow. in this morning. Oh wow, wow, wow! All right, so hey, um, and we got uh, yeah, and Paul, yeah, we got Paul, Paul as well. Jeez, awesome! So you got um, sorry, right, so you went, you know, just looking at your bio and and all that, but you know, I noticed that you also, in addition to Guru Dan, where, at what point did you start to train with um, Paul Bunek? So I'll see here in 2007, <laughs> I started working yeah. with a guy uh, doing private lessons with a gentleman named uh, Sean Kitzman. And at that time, Sean was an instructor under Paul Vunak and PFS. And I was it either 2007 or 2008. I forget. Uh, we flew out there to meet Paul for the first time. And it was myself, mm. Sean, uh, I believe Harender Subharwal, who everybody calls Sifu Singh now. Uh, who is oh, a yes, yes. The, uh, no, uh, no. Hindu athletic association. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and I believe his, his buddy, Brian was there as well. So the, the four of us and Paul and spent two days training out there, had a good time. Paul, uh, Paul certified me out there in Filipino martial arts and Jeet Kune Do. Uh, so he was actually technically my first bef before Guru Dan. Um, oh, okay. uh, I mean, as far as like getting instructor license, I, I had been training with Guru since around 2000 but I wasn't an instructor yet. So my first instructor license came from Paul and then grew right after. Gotcha. Um, Cause I was grew about 10 years before I became an instructor. Uh, but yeah, went out there and had tons of fun with him and learned lots of different ideas, lots of different mm. methods of training. I brought back playing the drums <laughs> from there, <laughs> from that trip. He'd sit out there and he'd play the bongos and we'd be training yeah. six at each other. And I, I got back home and I was like, I need some bongos. Mm. <laughs> And, yeah, that, that's, and that's music's, been a, music's been a uh, staple every class ever since. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, he, that's my JKD lineage and uh, ensemble is is to Vunek, uh, really? not directly, but a student is in Connecticut. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what did you want? Uh, so far as you know, the, the two. You know, what could you tell the folks just far as their teaching style and methodology, far as far as FMA is concerned? Say again. Who, who? Say one more time for me. I didn't hear you. Yeah. So far as Guru Paul and Guru Dan, oh. you know, compare and contrast as far as their teaching styles and methodology. Compare and contrast. If I were to compare, they're both excellent storytellers. Okay. <laughs> now my students know where I get it. Uh, 
if I were to contrast, I, I think there's lots of contrast between the two of them. Mm -hmm. I think um, um, Paul will give you very small amount of material okay. to, to really work and chew on. Mm. You know, like Guru will hand you the, the whole menu. Yeah. You know, Sifu Paul will hand you like a sample platter, little, little, and say, here, just chew on these little bites and see how you like them. Yeah. And I really think that a lot of that has to, you know, whether or not that's good or bad, again, is not the teacher. I think it's the student. How do you, how do you learn? What's your best method? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I don't, I don't think either way is exactly. I don't, there's a pro and cons to, of course, both pending the student. Um, you know, I mean, Paul Boonegger, I mean, was genius. I mean, like, if you look at, like, what he was doing in the 90s, I mean, gosh, and even in the 2000s, I mean, you know, I mean, like, how many people got those Black Panther tapes, you know? Them street defense tapes? Them street, were they street safe or something? I forget what they're called. Yeah. I got them on DVD tucked away. I got all that stuff, you know? I know. So, I mean, he, you know, like, he, man, I mean, like, he really, really had, you know, had a stake in the community. I mean, his, you know, I mean, you can't deny that. I mean, well, nobody else at the time was like, like renting out a bar, <laughs> you know, and filming, filming in a bar, you know, so it was that like, one with the, and with the motorcycle helmets on, yeah, taping up the hands, just blasting through, you know. And I think but those about were that classic. Time. Those were like, I'm telling you, like, if you look at the time when he was putting those out, so, it was so revolutionary, you know. Well, even now, people don't. Like, like the fact, like, oh, let's actually do this in a bar so you can see the tables and the chairs and all the stuff that you, can really, you can trip over, you know, mm. and, and how you, how different it is when you have a big open area to train in, mm. you know? So, yeah, I no, think, Paul, yeah. Paul, uh, I think Paul's very ingenuitive. No, I thought it was incredible. I just, I, it was, I thought it was, you know, it gravitated to many what he was doing. So, I mean, I just, yeah, wow. Um, so, Blintowak, let's, uh, matter of fact, no, you didn't miss it, Paul. We're just getting into it. Just jumped on. Did you guys just talk? You know, no, we're jumping into it right now. So, and, oh, we got GM Bobby here. Bradley, Abenir brother. All right. Oh, my gosh. Is that GM Bobby? Yeah, it is GM Bobby. Oh, my gosh. Thank yes. you. So it's good to see you. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah, good guy, man. Uh, we got Mary. I'm, I'm assuming Mary you know Mary. Cool. Yep. And, She's, yep, she trans Keithan. And Keithan. Wow. Oh, all right. You got the fan club here. Awesome. Dude, thank you guys. I appreciate the support. That is awesome. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so okay. Blintawa compared to, I mean, obviously I'm guessing you got into that later. Um, so you, you're jumping. So why Blintawa and what can you tell as far as in, you know, the different similarities into your previous, you know, uh, being the, you know, Anasano curriculum and all that. Sure. So the, the Balintawak that I have the majority of my time in, mm -hmm. um, I did private lessons for, I was a, I was a private lesson student for eight years under uh, Sifu David Hatch, who is directly. Oh, I had him, him and Linda. Yeah, nice people. And, yeah, and he's directly mm -hmm. underneath uh, my Ted Buett, who was, uh, I believe, Anchan Bakan's nephew. Um, and to my understanding, to, to what I remember, he, that, you know, he told uh, when, uh, Ted, I think Ted was an engineer and had opportunity to come to the United States and, 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 and mm. like, you're a good teacher. I want you to go. I want you to be an instructor. I want you to really get the yeah. stuff out, there, you know, on, um, and I believe, uh, Sifu had trained with him for, it was 10 years privately before Mon and Ted stroke. And then I know that, uh, he couldn't perform much after that, but I know they worked together on solidifying a, a buit, you know, curriculum. So, so I spent the majority of my time in that and, um, that methodology was very different than what I saw from the Balintawak from Grandmaster Bobby or from uh, like the Atilio Balintawak I saw come mm -hmm. through Dan. Um, and, and, uh, and I got to once, I mean, not, I didn't get to train with him, but once I got to uh, be in um, uh, Nene Gabakayan's house while he taught a uh, uh, private lesson to uh, John Spazano. And, uh, and that was fascinating to, to, to watch because it was so different than like what I had done. So what you see now is what I refer to as like the, the or what's commonly referred to, excuse me, is the grouping method where okay. there's, there's okay. different groups and like Grandmaster Bobby does that. And, yeah. and so 
and Nene. And you know what I what I think is excellent about that is it really helps speed development and reflex development. Mm-hmm. I think that, and also when you're teaching large groups, it gives them a format to go home and play with. Okay. The Bulinta walk that I learned uh, primarily from the, the Buit lineage was very different. That's the Ted Buit lineage, not the Sam Buit lineage, because uh, I'm told mm-hmm. the Sam I'm told the Sam teaches very differently. Uh, or taught very differently, I should say. But I, I don't remember if I got to meet Sam Buit or not. I feel like I did at some event, but I, I'm not. It wasn't anything where like I learned from him. Okay. Uh, but it was what I referred to as the random method, and it, it might actually be called the random method. But I, I call it the random method because it felt random to me. We would learn, um, you know, like. Here's your feed, okay? And you know, show me show me a couple of foundational, like fundamental things, and then it mm. was here's this. What would you do off of it? And I defend, okay. Now let's correct it, make it more Balintawak like, you know. And then like, okay, and then what would you do after that? Okay, I'll do this, or let's correct that. And so, uh, I was told that I would learn the same way that that uh, from Hatch that 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 Buit taught Hatch, okay. uh, which was the one-on-one, individualized, personalized method. So, uh, you know. Mon on Ted, I was told, had somewhere around 33 students, uh, which were all individual private lessons. Mm-hmm. And so all the students were very different from each other because he taught each one of them the Lintawak according to the natural path that happened in their lessons. First, like, here, this is step one, this is step two, this is step three. And so when I see my Balintawak in comparison to uh, what is kind of thought of as Balintawak on the internet now, like if you go on and mm-hmm. look up Balintawak, like all the super fast brrr, thousand transfers back and forth. Mm. Uh, not, not so much what I learned. What I learned was really more about like, you know, get in there and it's one or two, bam, maybe three hits tops and you're done. Uh, shut okay. it down immediately. And, and that's not trying to say that it was, it's a superior system. No, uh, no, it's, just the, it's just the mentality. There wasn't the intention of a back and forth like that. Okay. Um, and I, I think I like that. A lot because you know I had come from like the Inasano, the Inasano Kali uh, relies heavily first on pattern work and then you break the pattern, right? Mm-hmm. Where this was no pattern at all. This reminded me more of how I learned uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. You learn a technique and then you throw it in the roll. Good luck to you. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. no. <laughs> you got to wrap it, but you got to try to put it in. And uh, in the the Buit Balintawak, we we cover what was called Coreras, which meant the mixing bowl. And so we would learn a technique, connect it with a couple other techniques, and then you go in and you start flowing back and forth and try to try to apply what you learned, try to intentionally hunt for it, look for it, integrate it in. Um, and I, I enjoyed that process very much. So I, I held on to that. There's a lot of that that I keep now in my own curriculum because I think a lot of it was very functional. I always try to give credit mm-hmm. to where it came from. Sure. The biggest difference I see is with the fast – Balintawak we see today with the grouping systems. Um, it's very difficult for students to build up like body mechanics and not just have a BL arm. Now I'm no way talking about Grandmaster Bob because anybody that's ever stepped in front of him knows that that man can generate power. Oh my um, God, I was in front of him as house. It's, it's uh, yeah. yeah. I, I had the privilege. He, he worked with me at a seminar personally for about 20 minutes um, mm-hmm. uh, last time I saw him was a few years ago, and Paul Caseca actually host, uh, had, uh, not hosted me. Paul Caseca asked me to come down and let me stay at his place there, and we went in and trained. And getting the opportunity to spend that time with Grandmaster Bobby was amazing, and it made me look at that and go, "Wow, he can do it. He's got the body mechanics. He's got the mm-hmm. like." So I think it's harder to learn the body mechanics under speed. Uh, where I had the benefit of slowing everything down and really turning and mm-hmm. making whole bodies behind every shot. Gotcha. Um, but it, it's also much slower pace. You don't develop the same pop, 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 pop back and forth. Mm. So it's a, it's, it's, it's just different. And yeah. I really like them both. I would love the opportunity to work with um, a, like a highly qualified Tabawada instructor and, and get into that grouping system method and see if I can start to apply some of the wood body yeah, there you go. See what you I can think that would, that'd be super fun yeah yeah grandmaster Bob if you're watching I'd love to have you come visit <laughs> yeah yeah he would be like he's got I'm trying to think because I've covered him and a few of his instructors and I know I can't speak on I 
thought he, I could have sworn he had somebody in around Chicago, Illinois, I think, but he'll, um, I mean, Jesse, somebody only about two hours away from me. I just Jesse, finding the time. FMA Pulse, Jesse. Oh, I, uh, uh, I, I'm pretty sure he's under Jam Bobby. Jam Bobby, if you're still watching, you know, let us know. But I'm pretty sure Jesse's underneath him. Pretty sure. There's a, there's a gentleman. I think his name is Eric Lance as well. Okay. I shouldn't say that a lot. I'm not too sure if I got that name right. So mm. if I'm messing it up, uh, my apologies, Eric. <laughs> but he's not too far from me. We've discussed a yeah. uh, long time ago exchanging like, some knife for some top of water bull into walking. Yeah. Um, and now that the pandemic's over, chilled out right? a little or bit. We're not over, but. Yeah. It might, it might be, you know what? It might be time to open that avenue again for me. That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely, I mean, I know there's got to be people in your area, you know. Um, yeah, I'm sure it won't be an issue for you to find somebody. Um, so um, future systems that you would like to perhaps, assuming you had the time, you know, what other FMA systems that, you know, from afar you're attracted to that you wouldn't mind dabbling in? FMA systems. Well, I mentioned the Tabawada Balintawak, but, um, you know, I guess KI a little bit. I see everybody some of the that. Everybody, I'm telling you, when I asked that oh. question, everybody says it's your fault. KI. Because you, you put all, you get all these awesome KI guys on, and what am I supposed I to mean, do? I mean, just because I'm wearing a KI shirt, I mean, do not... <laughs> <laughs> you, you're always sending out that like that, subliminal that subliminal message to people, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know. So I mean, like, what were you what were you thinking? <laughs> well, you know, well, I you said, said it. It. hey, Guru, he just said it, Bobby, Jesse Santiago, FMA Pulse, just passed his quick last year. Oh, um, so okay. yeah, test passed his quick test or something. I'm I'm assuming that's what he meant. I'm I'm thinking, yeah, I'm assuming. Peter Paul. <laughs> so, all right. So, why KI? Like, what, what, what is, what is it? What attracts you? Okay. Well, I have uh, over the years mm -hmm. had three wrist surgeries and a shoulder surgery, mm -hmm. and so um, I know right now a big hot topic in Filipino martial arts is. You know, uh, it kind of started with the dog brothers, you know, the higher consciousness through harder contact. And then people, yeah. people have really like gone into like, you know, if you're not sparring, you don't know it's, you know, and, and, and I think that's great for people. Um, I personally, when I try to get into like whipping sticks back and forth at each other, super hard, like I wind up in, inflaming old injuries and scar tissues. And, 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 you know, so I'm, yeah. I'm really into, I'm, I'm into like, for me, I work on developing flow and then terminating that flow, like figuring out how to get into it and then get out of it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because I have no interest in exchanging back and forth anyhow. And, and, uh, cause that's, this will get you killed. <laughs> you know? No, no, no. I, I totally agree with you on injuries. Like I'm like, I'm 56 and I've had nine i've had multiple knee operations and uh one hip replacement i mean it's great i'm moving great now but my fear is injury like it sucks man you're on a couch and you can't do anything because you did something that perhaps yeah. you shouldn't have done and uh, who wants to go i don't want to keep going through that i mean i, I live my 40s in that i, I don't even yeah. want to see those days man <laughs> well I, I you know i um so I've worked on developing other training methods to get to a point of uh, functionality and practicality and, mm -hmm. and like finding flow and terminating flow is a big component of, of like how I teach now. Mm -hmm. um, and then using the different systems, the different branches to, because we have like three primary branches I put together uh, uh, to help put in different fields of flow. And one thing KI has is KI has its own definite little unique feel of flow and uh, I got to, uh, there's a friend of mine named Guru Conrad Kamen out in uh, mm -hmm. Arena, mm -hmm. LA. Yeah. And uh, Conrad, he, uh, he taught at the Inasano Academy for 10 years, but he also does other stuff. And um, mm -hmm. last time I was out there in 2019 for the pandemic, him and I got a chance to play around a little bit. And I was really loving like some of like the body leans and some of the elastico. And... Yeah, I know she's been doing work with like uh, was it Fabrizio Mansour or is that how you say his Farbri name? Fabrizio. Yep. Yeah, Fabrizio. And 
and um, and just the the beauty of his motion and the mm-hmm. flow, and that that was really interesting to me. Um, there's some other systems out there that there are systems out there. I think I would like to study. However, it would it would require the right kind of instructor that I personally gel with in mm. order to move forward. Because I find as I get older, it is not actually the systems I appreciate. It's the people and the teachers because they have a way of helping me see the system and appreciate it. Oh, ah, well said. But if you train under somebody, well, in KSK Martial Arts, we talk about KSK concepts, KSK philosophy, and KSK principles. This is not an ad for my school. Uh, but in KSK, but, but, this is not an infomercial. <laughs> yeah. But in KSK philosophy, what I believe in from my personal philosophy is the training here or through me or any training I personally take on mm. has to be fun has to be functional and it has to have a component of fitness. I need to keep moving throughout my whole life. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. if some fitness I can't go. If it's not functional and it doesn't work, then on any level, then I'm, yeah. I'm wasting my time. Now, some things work, but they work best in tandem with other stuff. You know that. Mm-hmm. And then the big one though is fun because it doesn't matter to me yeah. how functional something is. If yeah. you hate training it or you yeah, hate people or you just bad deal. <laughs> yeah, you just want to walk away from it. I've I've had systems that I loved that eventually yeah. I had to say, you know what? Me and this instructor are not vibing. I I just Yeah. I just need to go somewhere else. And and I found that like uh, cause I used to stick around with things in life. When I mm-hmm. before I was forty, I used to you know, you there's all sorts of egos in martial arts. You find mm-hmm. wonderful teachers and you find uh, egotistical teachers. Yeah. And I, I would easily train with both, both kinds because the art was more important to me. Yeah. Now, at 40, how I, the emotional state in which I spend my life is more important to me. And the people whom I spend my time with is so important to me. So I want to make sure that I, I take on, uh, I take on teachers that reflect my philosophy of fun. Mm. And, that's awesome. I think that was really well said. Like I, I never thought of it that way, but when I look back to why I left some people, you just hit the nail on the head. It's like I left them because I wasn't gelling with them anymore and I got a little older mature and I was, yeah, but that's, yeah, I yeah, know. I, I think that was well said. Yeah. Right. I mean, cause right. It's so easy to get caught up in the chase. You know what I mean? When you're younger, you know what I mean? It's like, no, I got to stick this out. And but back in your mind, maybe subconsciously, you can't stand the guy, but you're just, you get, you're, you're caught on in that chase, whether that chase is a certificate and we're all, you know, we all been there. I mean, it's part of the whole maturing process. And I know, I, I know I, I've been there, but, but yeah, you hear a certain age and light bulbs go off and you're like, I think when you're young and you discover (laughs) and you discover a person that, um, well, martial arts can almost, I, I joke about it with my students, but I say, you know, martial arts can almost feel like a superpower, right? Mm. If you have this ability that most other people don't have and it's, it feels really cool when you're really good at it, you know, or when you see somebody that's really good at it and you want that and that's your goal. Yeah, and if you're, you. if you're lucky to be under somebody who's very supportive and awesome, then that's great. But if you, if that person happens to be filled with ego in the moment and their teaching mm. is more about what they can do, not what about they can show you to do. Mm. Um, you know, when you're young, you're like, well, this is the source. So I got to keep doing this. It's not get older that you're like, man, you know what? I've had 25 amazing teachers. I bet you I can find another one too. I don't need to deal with this. And I'm not calling anybody because I've learned all my teachers, but I've definitely run into personality conflicts where I was like, you know what? I'm a good guy. And this person is a good guy, but for whatever reason, we communicate differently and it's not mm-hmm. working for us. So time to go find somebody that communicates in the way. Yeah, I you get one journey. You know what I mean? You're, you know what I mean? And you're going to, you're going to stay in a place where, yeah, I know. Yeah. I totally agree with everything you're saying. Right. And I just think that comes with maturity. I just think you could tell young bucks that, but I think they just need to go through it. They need to see like it happen. And then they're like, Oh, Okay, that's what you were talking about. You know, some years later, you know, it's like at eighty-five uh, years old. Imagine how many times Guru Dan's gone through that. 
I mean, yeah. I mean, speaking of which, I mean, what is he? Twenty something Kali systems he's certified in. Uh, the last I re the last I remember, I know that there was a hard number of at least thirty six FMA teachers. I I think it's more since then because the list I saw was an old list, and that list went up to thirty six. That's man. Those are Bugs Bunny numbers. Those are just man, those are just like well. You know, I, I, I think about it this way, and I, and, you know, I know we're zipping back to Guru Dan, but I, I think about it this way. When people ask me, how do you do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and JKD and mm -hmm. CLA and in Asano Crowley and Balint Walk? And, you know, uh, now I'm working with uh, Guru Daniel Anero on the XTMA program. And, mm -hmm. and uh, how do you do all these things? Number one, I'm a professional martial artist. I don't have a day job where I have right, to put right. in eight hours at a cubicle somewhere, you know, like, that's a, I built my life to be this way. Correct. Uh, I knew when I was in school, I wanted to do martial arts. My right. It wasn't an accident. You created it. <laughs> right. And, and that's exactly what Guru did. Yeah. He created, you know, like, like at, once he decided to stop being a school teacher and pursue martial arts full time, mm -hmm. that's all he did. He traveled, he taught, he, he, that's his whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, it is possible to get, to get good in multiple systems. It's just a matter of like, how have you arranged your time? Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I mean, obviously he did it, you're doing it. So I mean, it, it could be done, sure, you know, but the key ingredient, yeah, not having that daytime job is is gonna be very instrumental. Yes. <laughs> um, so when did you, okay, so you're going through your journey and all this, and when did you, when did you start to teach and um, let's let's keep it FMA lens for now. So when did you start to teach FMA? Okay, this is an FMA lens, <laughs> but I was teaching uh, a karate class That's great. Through, through a through a Parks and Rec uh, program, and there was a couple of students in there, and I at the time. I'm sorry. There was a couple students in there that I grabbed and pulled to the side and I would start to show them stick work because I didn't have any stick partners at the time mm. and I needed some. And so I was showing them stuff. And then once I started, you know, around 2000, once I started hitting the seminars um, in 2010, especially when I to the camps, but mostly around 2000, when I hit the seminars. I come back and be like, man, I got to work this material. Uh, let me grab this kid. Hey. Over here. You know, and I'm going to show him something that's a cool concept to me. He's going to think it's the wheel. He's like, going to think it's freaking yeah, right. Yeah, and I was like, well, it's called angle one. It's a new concept, you know. And <laughs> and and so so it was a mutually beneficial thing, you know. And then sure. in time, uh, more students wanted to be part of that. Mm. Like, well, listen, I don't want to take too much time away from the empty hand class, so we can set some time aside for it. And then that became its own separate thing. And it was just a training group. I wasn't advertising. It was just a training group right. um, so that I could get better. And somewhere down the line, probably when I started teaching out of my home, uh, oh boy, what year was that? 2003, maybe? Okay. Um, is sort of a, the garage training. Was Paul say garage training in 2012? <laughs> Yeah, Paul. So Paul was um, my first out of state student, I think. Uh, he's from Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, Paul's an awesome person. You get a chance to talk with Paul, you should. He's, he's under uh, um, Grandmaster Bobby and Patrick. Oh, sorry, Paul. I forget Patrick's last name, but he's he's a uh, Balintawak. Okay. Um, but um, uh, yeah. And so there wasn't like a moment where I where I was like, I am now teaching. It just nice. organically grew into that. I'm sure there were people at the time that were saying, you know, hey, that kid's not qualified to teach or whatever, but I don't think any of us are when we start. Yeah, you have to learn like curve like anything else. Yeah, <laughs> if, 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 you're, if you're a brand new parent with your first child, you don't have any, you're not qualified to be a parent. I mean, I know, there's it's just, <laughs> I know, so quick to, I know, it's, it's frustrating. <laughs> it Honestly, it's good. It, it, it is good because you know what it gives me? It gives me some perspective and humbleness when I see somebody else who's trying to teach and I, and they're doing a job that I look at and I would just cringe and go, it's not the way to do that. But the reality of it is I can look at that and be like, I remember when I was that person. Right. And then go chastise that person. 
pull that person aside and say, you know what? This is a great job you're doing. Let me give you uh, a way to do it 5% better. Right. Because people appreciate and uh, people always appreciate figuring out how to help them elevate than just letting mm -hmm. them know how far, how far down the ladder they are. Not only that, like you preceded with a compliment. Imagine if you went to that same person and you want to like, yeah, you know, that, that's just here. Wait, I, I got another way. Let me show you this other way to do it. But you, if you proceed with a compliment like you did, yeah, I mean, that's going to be so much more helpful. You know, you got to learn from your experiences. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I, I had an opportunity one time to work with, um, uh, to do a, a live demonstration with a with a very high level um, uh, martial artist whom I respect very much. And one of my one of my instructors were in the audience. Was in the audience at the time. And after I got done doing the demo, I was all excited and I walked by him and I was like, wow, you know, and, and he was like, mm, you did this, this, and this wrong. And that was the only thing he said to me. And that was one of those first moments where I was like, I think I'm going to move on. You know, like that was, that was one of those moments because I was getting mm -hmm. older and I was, I remember that feeling and I was like, yeah. do I want to feel like this? And, and, you know, um, and that was so helpful for me. Because that, that experience really helped me see like, okay, what do I want to do with my teachers? I want to make sure with the, the people in my instructor program that we, that we teach them how to not just communicate the material, but how to elevate people, how to make, how to make people interested in learning it. Like how to say, right. okay, you know, let's not look at what you're doing wrong. Let's, let's take what you're currently doing and make it better. Yeah, exactly. And if you, and if you can apply that, you know, now I take that from martial arts and I take it out of here and I do it with everything in life, I hope, you know, and, and it makes all my relationships better because when you lead with what somebody's doing wrong or you lead with even a joking insult, you never know how that hits another person or what kind Absolutely of thing. Absolutely not. Or what they maybe experienced previously in their life. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, no argument there. I mean, that, you know. well, ha having said that, my, my close friends group know that like we greet each other with joking insults, so. Yeah. So, oh, but by the way, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so do you teach um, FMA in your, your now present school? Do you teach it separately? You keep it separate component? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We do. Uh, I do a Filipino martial arts class four nights a week, uh, Monday through Thursday, but I wind up, I wind up teaching Kylie pretty much every day of the week somehow. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we, you know, you as a teacher now, and you're coming to your own, obviously, by just years and tenure. What do you try to instill in your students as far as their journey? Well, you know, stepping. You, you, I'm sorry. Like, as far as like the physical component of the art, or in general, what I want a student in their journey, no matter what the art is, to be. All of the above. Usually I like to ask a student, what is their goal? What brought them here? Mm. Because, um, you know, you can have one person walk in the school because they want to get fit. One person wants to do something fun and one person wants something that's functional. Right. Mm. So it follows the philosophy. And I typically try to say to people, you know, cause, um, you gotta, you gotta look for those things that, that you're doing it for, because I'm going to teach to all three philosophies, right? I'm going to try to do my best to all three philosophies. But some nights are going to be more one than another. That's for sure. So I try to tell people, you know, you got to figure out what is it that you're getting out of this? You know, what is it that you want from this? You know, are you, do you want to be an awesome fighter? Do you want to stay in shape? Do you want to just have fun? Do you like the flow component? Whatever it is, you need to make that your forefront. It doesn't mean you, you shouldn't play with the other stuff, but, you know, make that the thing you want to focus on really developing for you. Because that's the fun part, right? Mm -hmm. Is what you get out of it. And if you can't follow or you don't have that fun component, you're going to leave. Just like we said. Yeah, right. so, exactly. so ultimately, I think knowing and identifying why you're in a system, why you start it, is really what I want them to instill. Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. And then after that, it becomes why are you still doing this? Right. Ah. I like that. Why are you still doing this? I like that. What gets you in the door and what keeps you in What's the door? Keeping you there? Yeah, Did your objectives separate. change? Has your goals changed? I like that. Yep. Okay. Okay. 
No, oh, that's awesome. Awesome. I'm going to play a bit here. This is something I'm, you had it on your um, your website, and um, I wanted to talk about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's two more pulling around now. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Hopefully, folks, so you, can you see this? Yeah. Yeah, I can okay. see that little baby face. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> talking about here, I really want to folks, and I'm going to uh, talk about this here. Okay. It really resonated with me. You know, and you know, sometimes, sometimes I've been to, been to seminars, seminars and classes where, where it's more, it's more like, like, it's like, a, like, a, like a show. You're there, You're there to, see to see what the teacher, teacher can do, can do. not necessarily what, what, you what you can do. So I, I, so I, I try to communicate to students the best I can. Say, this, this is what, is what you, can do. Do. you can achieve this. If you achieve that, then we'll put this next thing on it. And if you achieve that, eventually you'll get up to what I can do. But I, but I didn't start there. there. So I think so trying, I think trying to, expect to expect people to start, to start with what, with you, what can you can do, do is ridiculous. ridiculous. And, 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 and I think I you're think setting you're a student up for failure. failure. If you start, if you start with, with that whole clip right there, I, I just I thought that was refreshing to hear. Uh, I think more uh, teachers should instill that and impart that to their students. Um, I think I'll, I'm as guilty. Uh, sometimes I forget to impart stuff like that. I just get caught in the the routine and all that, and it kind of just out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. But um, why do you feel that's, an, I, I thought that it was uh, really resonated with me. Like these students come in and they're they're gonna try to emulate you because that's the example they're seeing before. I mean, like why why wouldn't they do that if it, if they're not instructed to not do that? And uh, can you can you go dig, uh, go further into that? So when I was, my my father will sometimes joke about like he has no idea why I continued with the martial arts because the my first few teachers unfortunately um, when I say my first few I don't mean all of them but within a certain phase of my life I, I was training with multiple teachers and not all of them were the nicest people one of them mm. specifically liked to scream in my face. And I've had students there when I got screamed at in my face and I never liked that feeling. Oh and, God. and I used to, and at the time, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but me and my buddy, and you know who you are, if you're watching this, uh, we used to be joke around that we were the demo team, like, because we were always the two guys that were called up to uh, demonstrate stuff all the time at, at mm -hmm. seminars, class, whatever. And, and, uh, and he would scream in my face about, you need to be better. You need to be faster. You need to, you need to this and that. And I can remember, you know, you'd scream across the floor of people, you know, Hey, what are you stupid? You're doing it wrong or whatever. And, and, but then when he would demonstrate, he would always be like, he would just string a ton of stuff together that was so impressive to watch. And mm -hmm. most people trained with this guy because he is impressive and nobody to this day moves like this guy. Mm -hmm. And, and I wish I could say his name. I don't want to call him out. But I learned no, some no, no, no worries there. beautiful stuff from him too, but I would never call him out. Hmm. Um, but through that, what I discovered was him screaming at me to be faster never made me better. Yeah, or faster. <laughs> right. And then, he would, and then he would just add more stuff, make it a longer combination and a longer combination and a longer. And, and things just got worse because, okay, you're asking me to be faster and you're giving me something new with no refinement period. And I recognize, mm. you know what, this isn't, this learning style is not how I, not how I work. It's probably exactly how he learned. Probably exactly yeah, how he Yeah, you got from somewhere. Like old school generation, right? Mm. But for me, no. And so I, when I started teaching on my own, a big part of me was like, you know what, I do not want to put a student knowingly. I do not mm. want to put a student in that position again. And so he, you know, he helped me in my early 20s discover there are good teachers and bad teachers, and mm. we get to choose which kind we become. Right. Mm. That's important. We do not have to be a carbon copy of our own instructor. Right. Yeah. You know, because we, we want to emulate them so bad because we want to be as good as they are as martial artists, but sometimes we think that their habits, their personalities come with that, you know, mm. and – no, they're people, you know, yeah, and prone and, to error. <laughs> yeah. and you know what? They're prone to error, just like they're prone to beauty, you mm -hmm. know? So, so the same, cause the same people that, uh, 
made me say, mm, I don't want to do that. All those same people have all shown me things that I also use today because they were like, oh my God, that's genius. Or mm. that's, a, that's a beautiful way of looking at that. Or that's a perspective I've never seen. Or there are some things that I didn't appreciate till I got older and right. saw them in my own students. Were like, you know, that teacher was right. I was slow, you know, <laughs> like, whatever it might be. So every day you learn, but I find that I, there's, I've never had a teacher. I didn't learn something from that. I could, I could somehow turn around good, bad, whatever, build a plan. Yeah. Somebody else. yeah, I totally agree. Like you could take a negative experience, even though you want to repeat that experience and certainly not put anybody else through it, but yet you can learn from that as you know, as far as developing and uh, what to do and, yeah. and all that. So I, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I certainly don't want to give the impression I've only had bad teachers because that's, that's not the no, case. No, 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 no. I don't think anybody a lot of questions You've asked about my methodology. Most of my yeah. methodology has come from learning from things I don't want to. No, I think so. Like, or you don't want people to experience that you went through. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I didn't need screen that. I had a traditional teacher and actually the best thing that came out of it is I went to JKD and FMA. There you go. So out of that terrible experience actually open up all these doors. Like if that didn't happen, I sure as hell wouldn't be in right now interviewing you. <laughs> Hey, so open up a whole I wonder if it was the same teacher. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if it was. Hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so definitely. So I turned it around into like I could have gone home and just like I quit martial arts. I'm not doing a damn. I'm never doing this again and all that. But yeah, so. But yeah, well, I, you know it's funny. I've never had that moment. I've been doing martial arts since I was seven. Mm. I knew at five years old I was interested. Five years old, I knew. Seven years old, I started. I never looked back. Uh, I've had some of the most wonderful moments in my life revolve around martial arts. Some of the most heartbreaking moments of my life revolve around martial arts because I never stopped doing it. It's always mm -hmm. been part of me. And even in the tough times, whether it be uh, not seeing eye to eye with an instructor or a political issue, which are rampant, uh, mm. if, if, uh, or an injury, man, injuries and, and surgeries and rehabs. Oh, yeah. and at no point did I ever feel like I got to stop. Or yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It's, it's always been for me, all right, what can I do like this? Yeah. You know, like, okay, okay, I'm going to, I got, I got surgery on one hand. Cool. We're going to work mm. down on the other, you know, right, like, yeah. what do we do? Right. Okay. And I think, I think that mindset is part of what, what helps. No, I totally agree with you. Like, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like I could have, yeah, I mean, through injuries, man, I could have just threw the towel and just like I'm done. But there's definitely something inside of us that keeps us motivated and going, even despite that we might be in the most miserable aspect of our life in that very current moment, you know what I mean? But not to let it define us, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, wow. Um, so here's what I want to ask you, and um, yeah, I, I like when I get people on that cross train JKD and uh, FMA, and usually, you know, eight out of ten, it's usually you know guys who are under you know a guru Dan. Mm -hmm. um, from a conceptual, you know, so do you from a conceptual lens do you impart JD, JKD concepts in your FMA not only as a practitioner but with your students as well? And if so, how? Man, that's a loaded question, and you told me you weren't going to get me in trouble with any political groups. No, you know, no, ask no, me. No. You go use the three most political letters. No <laughs> politics. No politics. Um, okay. Okay, I'm going to do my best here. No, that's all. That's all we can ask. All right. Okay, so uh, I think amongst the Inasano community, uh, 100%. It, well, it doesn't have to be. You, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have rephrased that. It doesn't necessarily have to be under the umbrella of NSO, anybody for that matter that cross trains both. So, well, what I was going to say is, I first of all, my viewpoint starts with the Inasano group. Okay. That was my introduction to JKD. And turns out the FMA I was learning from my buddy when I was 16 was Inasano Kali. As soon as I got into Inasano Kali, I was like, oh, Are you, this all right, is right now. Okay. Um, but, you know, I think because for so many of us, especially if you were introduced to it through seminars, which mm. most people were, 
uh, Guru always taught the weapons and the empty hand side by side. Okay. You know, it was always like we're going to do a, a stick session and then a, then, a, then a trapping session and then a knife session and then we're going to do a sea lot session or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. And so when I was first, was first learning, all of this was like all blended together. There was very – it wasn't very clean as far as like being explained to you. Okay. What is this or that? And you had to ask other people in the community, like, I'm confused. Is this c -Lot or JKD? Because this is a JKD class, but he says that that c -Lot that he's doing. And mm. then you get into the principles. And so I think just by the nature of uh, a little bit of confusion, uh, because the arts are, are, are all shown side by side in seminars. Okay. I think it was a natural thing for the, the Inasano community people to go FMA and JKD and blend them together. Now, as far as like JKD principles go, again, I think that depends on who you're talking to because there's a lot of people that will argue about, you know, what Bruce Lee did or didn't say or what a JKD principle mm -hmm. is or isn't. What I can tell you is this. Uh, Guru Dan has always taught freedom with inside of his weapon system, just like he's taught freedom inside of his, the empty hand, which is the JKD concepts, right? You know, I almost wonder why, you know, like you could almost call it, if you say JKD concepts, you could also almost say FMA concepts too, because it all comes together, right, to, to blend. Actually, it's a good point. Yeah. And Here so I go. think, I think in that mindset, that makes the most sense. Also, there's a natural progression, right? Like, let's say, you tussle with the weapons and you're good mm. enough to actually get live disarms going on mm. at your empty hand. So it's a natural progression right in, right? And on top of that, JKD has trapping, Han and Tukin has trapping. JKD mm. in general, you know, is a HIA or hand immobilization entries. Yeah. Han and Tukin is essentially the same concept. Like they, you know, they, they, they will, um, uh, they'll intercept the technique and then, you know, they damage it on the way in, you know, right. with, with POSIX. It's, it's, it's just interception again, you know. So I, I think that the lines are very, they're very parallel. There's definitely some differences, uh, but they're, they're very parallel. I think they easily go hand in hand. I think so, too. Yeah. I do. I, and the reason why I think so, I look at it from the lens of five ways of attack. That's an FMA. Yep. So, I mean, right there. so, so there, there's your highway. I mean, there's your... There's your two lane highway. So I think, I think it's, I totally get why people do it. I really do. I, and, and it makes sense to me. You know what I mean? It totally makes sense. There's also a freedom, right? Like there's a, like you can, you can go do whatever in FMA and you can do whatever in JKD and you can enjoy mm -hmm. it. Right. Uh, versus being told, no, you can't do that. That's not part of the system. No, you yeah. can't do this. That's not part of what we do. Well, JKD and FMA rarely do that. They they're more of like sharers, right? They're like, oh well, I've seen it this way, this way, and this way. You know, like like which way do you like best? And and I, I think the ability for self expression that exists within Filipino martial arts and Jeet Kune Do is the is the tie that connects them together. I think that's your that's your your, your bridge between them is the ability of self expression. No, no, I. I I totally agree. I, I completely understand why people do it. I, I don't have an issue with it from, an, from a pure FMA lens, from a purist point of view. I, I think whatever helps a student get the material or if the teacher, that's the way that they like to convey with, to their class and it helps them to convey it better. I mean, who's to say? I, I think that's all. That's great. You know what I mean? Um, uh, what, speaking back off this, and again, I want to be careful. This this is, this is directed to no anybody, no organization, no certain persons, nobody. But this is going to be good. This is going to be good. <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm really trying to package it. Really. This is going to be good, <laughs> folks. Yes, I will be selling the Brooklyn Bridge. Just hang on. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from again, not direct to anybody, but again, just from observation on you know social uh, media and uh, you know that YouTube, what have you, whatever. Not including again from across those who cross train both. You know, we all know the you know the intercepting phase, the non telegraphic, you know, right, and all that. 
when I look at that was supposed to be really truly advocated as far as the JKD and all that, and then the people that simultaneously train both, why do I see a disconnect in FMA as far as the attribute development? Well, I think that there, like anything else, there's going to be several answers to that. I don't yeah. think there's just one. Well, first of all, I here, think- before you answer, am, okay. am I wrong? If, in my, if so, where am I? Am I wrong? No, I'm... I'm I'm positive that you can find a person whose FMA and JKD look nothing alike. I'm 100 percent positive of that. <laughs> you know, uh, so no, I don't I don't think you're wrong. Uh, I'm sorry, that wasn't meant to sound. <laughs> no, 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 no. You actually, no, no, no. I just, yeah, no, no, no. I'm just trying to make it as easy as possible for you. Yeah, I just want to yeah. I, I think I think number one, it might have to like there are people that learn their FMA and their JKD from two different people, right? Good point. Yeah. I didn't think of that. Yeah. So, so if you learn two different people's methodologies, you're going to have a disconnection until you personally figure out how they connect for you. And then you shouldn't look like either one of them, right? Mm. Um, or at least your approach will be different, uh, even though it's both of them combined. Uh, I think another thing is might be the era of which you learn. That's not uh, a good point. You know, yeah. If you learn from one instructor, how many instructors did they learn from that they're blending together? And how many lynches beat are they down? You know what I mean? Hundred you percent. Know, what was their focus? Did you have a, a JKD guy that was about uh, uh, the preservation of Junfan for, for this? You know, from 1960 whatever to whenever, or mm-hmm. you know, and an FMA guy who was like, "No, you need to crack their skull open and get out of there." You know, like there's you could learn both methods. You know what I'm saying? So it depends yeah. on it depends on where you're coming from. You know who the instructors are, what their methodologies are, most definitely. And also, if you have two students that are learning from the exact same instructor, but their goals are different, sure. their physicalities are different, their amount of time they have to dedicate to it are different, yeah. then you you're going to see very different results and disconnections or connections there too. In my I opinion. No, I, I thought you answered that fantastic. <laughs> I thought you did. You know, yeah, I thought you, yeah. There, I mean, there were a couple of things you did. You know, I thought that was well done on your part. Um, and, and again, this is not to say this is not bad, good, indifferent. You know, you know, you know what I notice sometimes in this community. It's like if you make an observation, in other words, not criticizing, but just critiquing. Like, hey, I'm looking at this and I'm noticing this, but you're not really cri- you're you're just you're making observations of what you're seeing, but it so easily gets, you know, trends like where well, he's criticizing. Sure. No, I'm critiquing what I'm seeing. I'm not like, but it's and I get and I know it's like a fine line and all that, but it's just sometimes I just uh, you see that where it gets easily even trans you know transferred into like criticism. Yeah. You know? I, again, I think it comes from the source. So mm. let's say, for instance, let's take a, let's take a basic disarm. Mm. Okay, just take a basic disarm of your, not something super fancy, just something that most students are able to learn with a, a minimal amount of training. Okay. Yeah. One person might criticize that who has, or I'm sorry, critique. See, I just did it. <laughs> one person might, one, <laughs> uh, see, I told you you're going to get me in trouble. One person might critique that and say, Say like, uh, I don't, I don't think that's that's gonna work. And if that person has absolutely no training, has never picked up a stick, and has spent their mm-hmm. whole life hiding behind a, a game, you know, a, a gaming joystick and a keyboard, then then that does sound like a criticism, right? Yeah, now, yeah, yeah fair if, enough. Yeah. If I if I'm doing that exact same disarm, and Grandmaster Bobby comes up and is like, you know, I think uh, you should maybe do it like this. I think you'd be better off if you turn to the side or if you added mm. the other. Well, huh. A lifelong Filipino Filipino martial artist is giving me advice about something he's taught all over the world. That's a good critique. I think I'll listen. So I think yeah. So source matters, right? Yeah. Source matters. Um, personal temperament matters if you're sensitive can't take it no if you're oversensitive yeah (laughs) and some and some people some people don't know when to to cut somebody's opinion off 
because you'll have also if you listen to every person's opinion about how you do something and try to change it to to match everybody's everything so they're not criticizing you anymore yeah. you will that's an, a recipe for utter failure at a yeah. certain point you have to you have to say this is how I'm doing it for a while because this is this is what I believe in and and I'm okay to it changing but I don't have to change just because you disagree with it right no you know, and, and once you can do both those things, you can have an open mind and you can also be confident in your own discovery. I think I think then things start sounding less like criticisms and, and more like just opinions. Yeah. Well said. Well said. So an FMA discussion, I'm the uh, zookeeper. I mean, uh, the uh, administrator. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> oof, I, uh, yeah, that was a <laughs> But uh, and you can see that. <laughs> and you see that like because a lot of times i have to go through these and like hey i'll mess it you know could you just change that i i know what you're trying to say but i'm trying to keep this a very clean form where people can express themselves and not be attacked sure. uh, but you see that fine line it's like you know whether it's criticism or it's critique and some just you just say something it doesn't matter you could have the best intentions in the world they're just gonna they're just overly sensitive they're not, you know, they don't want to take hear anybody else's opinion. They're not receptive and they're just going to, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't. Yeah. You, the, the trick with those people is to recognize them as soon as you can. And yeah. Then move. yeah. And, then move. <laughs> and, then, and that's okay because you know what? Someday that yeah. person 20 years down the road might come to you and be like, man, you know, when I was involved in that group, I was so brainwashed to think things were only this way or that way, yeah. and, you know, and I've had that happen, which is yeah. really cool. Come around. Yep. I've, yeah. I've had that happen. And I'm sure somewhere over the years, there's somebody in a martial arts school right now talking about, yeah, I used to train with this 25 year old guy named Kent Nelson that just thought he knew what he was doing the whole time. And, you know, like I'm sure that exists out there too. Yeah. It's all balanced. No, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, exactly. If, yeah, like I, I'm sure there's people saying, you know, you know, what's what's Dean Franco, non-Filipino, what, what what is he doing running an F, and, you know, this group and all that. <laughs> it's like you, you gotta know, just, you know. You know, I've never really gotten um, whatever flack I've gotten over the years. Yeah. I've never gotten them. For, I've never gotten much of it from Filipinos. Hmm. I've gotten it from, uh, you know, American-born Filipino martial artists. Uh, uh, that with no Filipino heritage, uh, probably you know, jealousy, right? You know, jealousy. but I, but I've never, I've never like, I've, I've just never had a Filipino person, you know, mm. step up and be like, "Yo, you suck at what you're doing, yeah. and you're you're representing us poorly." I've never, I've never had that. So, and then I'm sure there's probably somebody out there that feels that way, but I feel grateful that I've never had to have that encounter, you mm. know, and uh, and if that should be the case someday. I guess I would love to say to that person, cool, show, show me your way, show me your opinion because yeah. I would love to see it. Cause it, it might influence me, you yeah. know, cause I have a mind, but I'm secure enough to believe in my stuff. That, that's the whole thing. And that's what I was going to say. A lot of the, I think of, of that grouping, I think a big thing of it is insecurity because if you're secure, like you're not going to be affected or nowhere as nearly as much. As a matter of fact, like exactly like I really believe like I'm in the student lane. Like I want to be the best version of myself as a student. I'm always a student, even though maybe I crossed a few more bridges than the people I train, but I'm uh, at the end of the day, I'm still a student. So if somebody has got, they can show me and prove my journey. Like I'm all for it. <laughs> you know, what I mean? I hear you. <laughs> you know? Well, my, uh, my school walls are covered in, pictures of different people I've trained with over the years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, initially I was a little hesitant when we started picking the pictures that we were going to put up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of them are teachers who I've trained with, you know, every day, private lesson or, or not every day, but every week, you know, a private lesson, at least once a week. And, and, you know, others are teachers I've been with 20 years. And some of them are people I just got to train with one time. Mm -hmm. And I, and initially I was like, you know, I don't know if I should have a picture up with somebody I just trained with once. But the reality of it is that person gave me something that then I built on top of that I teach mm. all the time. And I, I want to be able to go back and give the credit whether I, whether I 
whether I saw the person one time right. or I saw the person 101 times, I want to be able to point to the picture on the wall and be like, this guy right here gave me that. This guy right here gave me that. And this guy over here gave him that, yeah. you know, to, because I think that's how we see that. Like we are all a big family because most of the people, people on my walls have also taught each other. Mm. You know? Yeah. I no, I totally agree. Like, yeah, just because you just met maybe one day with this person and maybe it was only one hour, but they, man, you left, they imparted in you like, like a concept, a tactic, a technique that you are not only really resonates with you, but you're able to also get to your students. Yeah, they should definitely be up there. Yeah. I have a I have a picture on my wall with Jim Boy Hefe, who um, mo most people don't know who Jim Boy Hefe is, but um, he's a Filipino. But uh, he trains uh, with An Shang and with uh, with with Ted. And he mm -hmm. was I believe he was a, a airline pilot for years and years, but. Uh, on Manon Ted Bullitt's 80th birthday, uh, Jim Boy flew in, uh, I think from Singapore, uh, to be there for that. And at that time, uh, Manon Ted was in a uh, hospital bed uh, inside in his home. He couldn't move because of the stroke very well. But we, you know, the, the, the students gathered together, and I was I was very blessed to be there. And I was I think I was the only second generation student there. Everybody else were you know people that trained directly with Manon Ted. I was I was the only student of student. Mm. And I had the opportunity, you know, when everybody started leaving, uh, Jim Boy says, if anybody wants to stay here and train, I'm on Singapore time. So I'm good. And I'm a total night owl. So everybody left. And I stayed there at, at uh, Mon and Ted's house in the basement with Jim Boy. And, and he showed me all kinds of cool concepts at night. It's the mm -hmm. only time I've ever gotten a chance to work with him. Um, and just some of the simple stuff we played with back and forth and using the live hand and how to monitor or delay the stick, control the motion, mm. um, just things that I had never, I had never seen because you know, he got to train with Mon and Ted and he got to train a little bit with, with the Antron, I believe. And then the way he would train is, is, uh, he would train in the plane if he was flying cargo or something, you know, like from what I'm told, he was flying. Cargo. Oh, okay. yeah. And so, you know, he'd always be working by himself and he developed movement and mechanics that hadn't come from the others because he had to fill in the gap solo. And so, you know, I learned some of that, some of that from him, some of his personal fill in work too. And, and I built on a lot of that, that really, that really inspired me those few hours down there with just him. Cause I mean, what an opportunity. Yeah. And I think we train, I think I finally left at like 3am or something like that, but it was, it was a, it was a great opportunity and, and just once, but his picture hangs on my wall because of yeah. the knowledge he passed to me that night. Absolutely. No, I totally agree. I mean, right. I mean, I don't think the time reference is that's not what should be significant, you know? Um, so, you know, just what are your own thoughts on, uh, on our community? Well, actually, wait, Oh, forgot. I want to get into, so you trained an actor. So let's, let's, uh, let's hear about it. Uh, yeah. So I trained, uh, uh Jesse Eisenberg for his role in, um, uh, American ultra. Um, okay. So I, I got a call from uh, a gentleman named Alonzo, and I forget Alonzo's last name, but he was in Louisiana, and he was the choreographer for, for this movie. And at the time, Jesse Eisenberg was in Michigan filming um, another movie with Jason Siegel. Uh, and at that time, they were in Grand Rapids, I believe. Okay. And uh, – Basically, what he wanted me to do is he wanted me to drive down to Grand Rapids and train Jesse for the three weeks that he was down there filming. Okay. And, you know, I got a, I got kind of a nice compliment from him on the phone because uh, I said, like, man, I got to tell you, there's some good people in the area, you know. And he, go, he, go, he says, you know, I've looked all around Michigan and specifically I want what you do for this. Mm, movie. Nice. Yeah. So can, you, can you help him? So, so, so. We went and we, we trained Jesse who spent uh, three weekends with him. Uh, he was awesome. He was fun to train. Like he showed up ready to go. He wasn't late. He wasn't on his phone. Yeah. He wasn't this and that. He, he showed up and he was like, is this what we're doing today? You know, and, and we got to do a bunch of great stuff with him. And then when he came back, um, when that ended, he came back to Michigan to film scenes in East Lansing uh, when he played Lex Luthor in uh, Batman versus Superman. Okay. And it was kind of cool. He, he, he reached out to me. So 
So I was leaving to go to Boston that day. <laughs> I was I was packing my bag and I had everything laid out, you know, in, in my house and getting ready to go teach a seminar in Boston. I get a phone call from Jesse Eisenberg and he's like, hey, I'm in town. Uh, like, do you want to get together and do some training, grab some food while on my off time? And I was yeah. like, I got a plane in five hours. Sure. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> and I I scooped him up and, and took him back to the school and we did some Kali, uh, had some fun with that. Got, got him some food and then I just barely made that plane. You just barely made your plane. <laughs> <laughs> Super nice guy. Re- loved to get to work and it was really cool to, to be sitting in the theater for American Ultra and see like, oh, I specifically showed him that and I remember he struggled with that. Now to see him do it on screen is amazing. Oh, that's got to be, man, that's got to be, that's got to be incredible to like see that and knowing, wow, would you give him like, I mean, just generally for, for the viewers watching this or later, would you give him so there wasn't, he was not trained at all. He wasn't like a super physical mm. person. And um, uh, that's not as a slam. He just wasn't a martial artist. Uh, like he was unfamiliar with our movements. Uh, and what will wind up happening is, is there was not a fight scene written. Like I wasn't teaching him how to do the fight scene. Instead, okay. what I would do is I would teach him core concepts and common uh, movement pathways mm. uh, from Filipino martial arts, from JKD, from Silat Muay Thai. Uh, and essentially I would wind up like filming clips of that with him and then sending that to the choreographer. And as he would see Jesse get better and see the things that Jesse was good at, he started forming the, to my understanding, he started forming the fight scenes around the skills that Jesse got while kind of under my guidance. At uh, Louisiana, I'm sure there, I'm sure they continued his training in Louisiana, mm. uh, on set, but cause he did an amazing job. I, th- I thought it was great, but, um, but he did a he did an excellent excellent That's job. Awesome. No, he man. That's, and I thought that was a neat way to do it, you know. Yeah, no, yeah, right. Like, yeah, right. And then send it off to them and they can kind of critique, adjust, and yeah, no, no, that's awesome. Wow. Okay, cutting edge tactics. So uh tell us about it. That's a deep cut. <laughs> that's hey, all hey, was it was it tactical? Was tell it tactical? Us about it. <laughs> so uh, when we talked yesterday briefly, yes, I, I, I told you that I, uh, I have a friend of mine, Brian Valentine, and uh, that uh, he was an officer with Ingham County Sheriff's Department, and he was their um, R&D guy for defensive tactics, okay. and, and uh, he would bring me in, and he's the one that looks exactly like you. <laughs> okay, right. I remember the reference. Yeah. I'm totally sending him this podcast, by the way, when we're done. He's going to freak out. Um uh, you didn't know you interviewed me, did you? Yeah, but, uh, so, so he would get me in there and, and we would play, we'd play around with different stuff. And then we would play with knife stuff. Basically it'd be me and him and one other person named uh, Robert Verdell and another guy named Perry. And we would, we would get together in like Brian's basement and beat each other up essentially. You know, and we would play with ideas. They were doing it long before me. I was like the fourth person to get into the group. And that was also my first experience in grappling, by the way, uh, getting beat up by those guys. It was pretty fun. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and that kind of led to like, well, I said, you know, we could really use some stuff for knife. Mm. So I started working, trying to put some Filipino martial art concepts together that would work for law enforcement and trim that down. And at the time, you know, he was like, listen, we can't really – he didn't say it like this in the paraphrase, but in the conversations we, you know, it was, it was like, yeah, martial artists aren't like super highly looked upon in the law enforcement community. So like, if you go in and you're KSK martial arts, mm. nobody wants to listen to you, but if you're cutting edge defensive tactics, see the tactics, see? See, it's about the president. It's about who's, who's doing it, right? Who, what you yeah. listen to. If you go in and you say, you know, I'm going to do a pock and a lop, yeah. They don't want nothing to do with it. It's martial arts. But if you go in and you say, I'm going to do a tactical slap and a tactical clear, yeah. all of a sudden it's like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's really just a matter of, because we're all humans and it's all movement, right? Mm. So it comes down to figuring out the language that another person needs to hear to receive the message. There you go. That's all, that's all teaching is figuring out the language another right. person needs to hear. What to they want to hear. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I had a great time, but, uh, and and I did that for a few years. Uh, I got to work with a few different agencies and, uh, what I discovered, I really enjoy 
is I really enjoy teaching police officers. I still teach police officers, but I don't go to departments like I used to. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I enjoy police officers that I get to work with, like that, like they train differently when they come to me, mm-hmm. they have a different mindset than if they're forced to go to a, a, a mandated. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. You go to a mandated training. Everybody wants to sit. I shouldn't say that because it makes that law enforcement sound bad. Mm-hmm. And that's not the case. There's some amazing law enforcement professionals out there, oh, but yeah, for sure. in general, you will always pursue something uh, with with a more sincere attitude. If it's something that you're pursuing and not something. Mm, something will pursue. No, 100%, 100%. Yeah. I mean, and the thing is I had Jared, you know, I had two on Jared and Ken Jowers. Ken Jowers is a, a police officer in Tennessee kind of under Jared and all that. And it was amazing. And we touched upon this, like those who are proactive, like in their job training and those that just they're going to it because they're mandated to it. They have to, they have to fill a quota, you know, whatever that, that may be for the year's training. And, um, you know, but like you said, though, the ones that you get, like, you know, they're vested, like they're coming to you. Like, you know, like they really are taking this seriously. They really want to get stuff that's going to prove everything on their job performance. God forbid that day comes, you know, so I, you know, I, I, I really enjoy, I really enjoyed uh, passing the material on to people that are likely going to wind up having to use it yeah. you know? because it makes me, it gives me a, a, a feeling of like, like mm, you hope that your civilian students never have to use it in the majority, yeah, well, yeah. The majority of them won't, but the majority of your LEO and military students, they literally put themselves in that position every day. Mm. And so, so, you know, what's, what's really nice is when you get those phone calls, you know, or you get those messages like, uh, you know, when a, when a police officer student of mine uh, reached out one time and was like, hey, you know, like uh, you just saved my life tonight. You don't you don't know, but you did. I had a student this year uh, about a, about six weeks ago reach out to me and said, uh, you know, I just had a gun put to my head. Um, I, I uh, if it wasn't for if it wasn't for the stuff I learned during my time at your school, I'd be dead right now. Mm-hmm. And. I called him up and I was like, dude, tell me the story. <laughs> you know, like I want yeah, to know. Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, like every time I get something like that, it, it makes me feel like I, I'm doing more here than just like that guy. It's good when you, when you help somebody with their, something in their personal life and something like makes them feel good about themselves. But when you know that there's kids out there whose dad came home tonight because of you, because of something you passed on to that person that they were to, able to apply when they needed it and, 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 get to go home. That's a, that's an amazing feeling. And yeah, I love that's it. gratifying. You know, 100%. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I, I discovered that passing that on to people who want to learn that are important because mm-hmm. trying to pass that on to people that don't care or, or they're just like, yeah, I just got to yeah, be there. They're not enthused. You're seeing it in their yeah. faces. Who wants to be there? I mean, like I don't want to teach, I don't want to teach those people. <laughs> it helped me find my lane. It helped me find the, the people that I want to work with. Right. That, it, right. Right. And, it, and that makes me happier. Yeah, one hundred percent. No, no, no. So we're here, okay. We're finding that man. Oh my God, we're almost going two hours. This is, you know, what's so funny. You know, when talks go really well, or you know, where? Well, let me put it this way: when I know interviews go really well, when I look at the time and it just, like, you know what I mean. And this has yeah. been one of those. So kudos to you. <laughs> I'm just enjoying talking with you. I love talking FMA. So fire away. Yeah. Um. So what do you uh? So, I mean, what are your future goals for yourself, school? I mean, what's coming down the pipeline? Well, I uh, see for myself personally, uh, I've got my my sights set on continuing continuing to improve and my improve. Let's try this again, shall we? I got my sights set on continuing to improve on uh, getting better at my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. Uh, learning how my jujitsu changes as my body changes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm at my three stripe purple right now. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, uh, and I've talked about this with my jujitsu teacher. You know, I'm, I'm hoping to see 44. I'd like to see if it's possible. If I could, if I could make it to black by 50. Um, if I, if I don't, then I don't doesn't mean I'm going to quit, you yeah, know, right. but I, you know, but that's, that's a goal keeps me moving forward, you know, and yeah. if I have to change, I have to change, but keeps moving forward. Um, I, uh, I just, uh, the other weekend I brought in, uh, guru Daniel Lanero, uh, uh, from the Inasano Academy and the founder of the XTMA program, okay. XTMA program. 
Uh, and, you know, every time I work with, uh, I work with Guru Daniel, um, I always get inspired. I like every time I, I feel his energy, every time, you mm. know, touch hands, I, every time I watch him move and I can feel like the, the, the smoothness of his sea lot is amazing to me. Uh, so much of what he does is like, I'm, I, I look forward to many more. Like, we're close in the same age. So mm. we're like three years apart. So I look forward to lots of years of, of getting to, to work with Guru Daniel and getting to know him more. Um, been under him for a little bit now. And that's okay. been, I forget the exact year. It, it might've been 2019, but I'm not sure. I don't want to misquote okay. that. But, um, that's kind of like my, like I said, if I have an, if I have an avenue open up, you know, for like maybe a, find a good, another good teacher whom I enjoy working with Filipino martial arts, I, I would probably pursue that. I've been doing, um, uh, Rukyu Kobudo Renrukan for the last like 18 months, which is a, uh, Kobudo system that has a, it's a lot more fluid movement, not a lot of hard, mm -hmm. sharp strikes. It's more, uh, it's going to sound strange. It sounds strange every time I try to explain it to somebody, but it's a system that's designed where the weapon work is literally designed to make your empty hand better. And that's, okay. that's what I find interesting about it. Because up until mm -hmm. now, it's always been the weapons make the weapon work good. And sometimes the weapon work follows the hand or the hand follows the weapon, like very common, you see knife, right? Mm -hmm. FMA, not, the hands follow the knife. But in the in the Rukyu Kobudo Renrikan, it's much more like um, the weapon teaches your body like how to sink, how to move, what muscle group to focus on when you're doing certain movements. Okay. And that has greatly increased my empty hand, like surprisingly so. And so I'm I'm kind of in love with that right now. I just got actually I just got my showdown um, on Monday, <laughs> Valentine's oh, Day. Congrats. Okay. And so I look forward to keep moving, keep heading down the road there. You know, and awesome, develop awesome. that even further. And um, what about the, for the um, school overall? Or your system? Well, we just moved in this location uh, two years ago. We moved in here. We signed the lease three days before the pandemic. Wow. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> That's pretty sweet timing. I'm not going to lie. Oh, wow. <laughs> but uh, uh, that was that's worked out really well. Um, okay. you know, it was scary for a little bit, for sure. Oh, I can only imagine. It was growing well. Um, you know, something I think I'd like to do in time, I'd like to really build more of an instructor program. I recognize that I cannot teach every class every day. I did that for at least two decades. I taught every class every day. And now I have a, a yeah, now I have a wonderful group of people. I still teach every day, but mm. I have a wonderful group of people that, um, that train with me that uh, have instructors instructor titles under me that I, I absolutely trust. They're great people. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that, that I need to put more time into them and more time into developing great instructors because yeah. I can't, it's going to be harder and harder for me to get my hands on every single student, you know, and I really want to, I want to see my, my seminar work increase. I want to get more trips out to Boston. Mm -hmm. My Boston group is amazing people run by guru Daryl Smith. Um, mm -hmm. They're, they're such fun people, and I was going out there a couple times a year. I think we we're going to do three times a year starting in uh, 2020, and then COVID hit. And uh, so I want to <laughs> get back up there, help them grow, but I want to build good teachers. I, yeah, I, take the load off you down the road, and I mean, especially it, if they're qualified and they're good to go. You know, I mean, it, it is, but but it's that's true. But what it's really for me, like those are the people that. I pour my heart into my time, mm. my soul. And so I only do that with people that I enjoy their company. I enjoy yeah, yeah. being around them and I see something in them. So these are people like, I tell my folks, like if, if you get an instructor title from me, it's because I, you know, I plan, I'm prepared for you to be in my life for the rest of my life. Yeah, right. Because I think of you like that. You're a person that I wouldn't want to see fade in my life. And Correct. that's why you have an instructor title from me. Um, and so focusing on finding more quality people like that in my life and strengthening the bonds of the ones I currently have, mm. that's what's important for me for my school because that will, that will grow on its own. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just crazy. Yeah. Harmony. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, this has been a wonderful interview, and I, like, I appreciate you coming on. I mean, um, 
Any, any, uh, any final thoughts for the FMA community? Final thoughts for the FMA community. Yes. <laughs> you know, I don't know about thoughts as so much as I, as much as people disagree in the FMA community and as much as people like to get all political and whatnot, because it happens in every martial arts community, not just the mm -hmm. FMA community. True, 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 true. But I think what I, I think I, in general, I'd like to say, despite all that, I say thank you. I'm appreciative because like FMA and martial arts in general have given me the ability to express myself and communicate mm. things that I can't do with words. Uh, I, I, I can, I express feelings through flow. I express feelings through teaching. I express feelings through, you know, whether it's clinch or rolling or whatever, cheese hour, who, but like, I feel who I am in those moments and I, and I feel that language that's spoken between the other person. And I, and I recognize the, like the sacredness of that. And I mean sacredness because both of you have to work on developing that language to speak. Mm. About, right. Like you both have to invest in the time. And so for me, if it wasn't for the FMA community, whether they agree or not, I wouldn't be able to do that. It helps me make a living which allows me to go learn more things, which allows mm -hmm. me to be a better teacher to my students. And, and so I'm, I'm appreciative. I think that the FMA community now should really start to pay attention because there's guys like you out there. You know, there's guys like Paul Ruby out there with uh, is that a uh, FMA source. <laughs> yeah, I believe you're correct. I the dumpster fire. Yeah. I think he, you know, like, He's shining spotlights, your shining spotlights, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's a, there's a few more of you guys that are out there doing it. And, and I think that's great. And I think we have a better opportunity to learn from each other 100%. now, especially now that we're all out there on social media, we can all mm -hmm. see each other's faces and we're all can have to be a little responsible for what we say about each other. Correct. Right. And I think that, I think that's a good thing for us. It'll bring us, to, it'll bring us to the table to talk and to share and exchange. Yeah. And, you know, and critique and criticize. <laughs> see, I'm right. See, I already changed you. You're saying critique. See, yeah. <laughs> I totally agree with you. I mean, like, I think, I think, um, you know, uh, people like, you know, when, when I started the show, you know, it wasn't just me because I, you know, I had nothing better to do really. It was me really want to say, I, yeah, I could sit back and complain and like and not like current affairs was going on committee or i can do something about it yeah so i chose to try to do something about it now i i'm not saying i'm you know 100 I, I i no no way but if i can get choose uh, you know affect a few get a couple groups talking get groups with under an umbrella talking like the ki theme and all that man you know what hey that's still you know those are results you know what i mean you know yeah. And I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a wonderful thing. I, I yeah. do because when I mentioned this to you last night when we did a little pre-interview thing, but I just through your, just through your podcast alone, I've, I've been exposed to people that I didn't really, and maybe I'd heard the name maybe, but like yeah. now I got to, cause there's, there's so many, there's so much. No, there's a lot, there's a lot. But, but when a moment comes by that I can like, uh, we're talking about the Mark Wiley podcast. You know, All right. Mark Wiley and and group Brandon Rick. Yeah. Brandon Rick. I couldn't remember. The, thank you. Yeah. Um, but uh, there was something in that that uh, I was kind of listening to it and getting ready to start my day, and there was something in something that 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 uh, group Mark Wiley was saying that I, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting and got me listening more. And the next thing you know, I'm like sitting on the couch looking at my phone. I'm all sucked into it, and then yeah. and I'm like, oh, I think he's talking about that. And, and I would that I would have not had that experience had it not been for your podcast, you know. Yeah, so, no, so appreciate I that, appreciate yeah. what you're doing. Well, I, thank you. That's I mean, that's that's what really makes it worthwhile is when people tell you that, like, hey, I appreciate what you're doing. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, Mark Wild. I mean, that was that was the first one kicking off the Ki theme, and he was fire. I mean, I you know I I always respected him and all that, but. I've developed more profound respect for him since like hit well when I just interviewed him, A, and then having him on for the KI theme. It's just, you know, that guy is just man, more and more people I, I think 
if they can ever have the opportunity to meet with him or talk to him, he's just a, what not just a wealth of information, but just really knows the timelines and when things happen. He might not be as more vocal about it, but man, don't, don't that guy knows, man. <laughs> that guy just, and that's, that's probably what drew me in was that he knew his histories, and, and that percent. not everybody does that. You know, yeah. and, and to be honest with you, I could be better at it. You know, I, yeah. but uh, yeah. I'm grateful for those out there who are keepers of the knowledge. You know, yeah, right, right, right. He's Before he's he's Please. clearly when it comes to Ki. He's clearly one of them. You will never, yeah, no argument here. I mean, you know, people don't want to hear that and all that, but the fact is, and believe, I know this for a fact, he is as far as history is, yeah, one hundred percent. You know, uh, but. uh but man, it's been great. I appreciate it. You know, appreciate you coming on, and uh, hopefully, um, I do theme episode. So I'm um, so uh, maybe we can get you and your buddy on there. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 Daniel, I'm sorry, Guru Daniel. Is that am I correct? Are you talking about Daniel Lanero? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the from XTMA. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we'll get you both on down the road. You guys can talk about, you know, your different lanes as far as you're I mean, he's I'm both under Guru Dan, right? I mean, he's on the Guru Dan as well, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. 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 It's been yeah. Guru, uh yeah. more than a couple of decades. Yeah, yeah. So that'd be interesting to just see what you guys even though you guys are both on there, but you know, your guys' different paths and what have you. That that'd be kind of neat. You know? you know, I really for for me, I think, you know, uh I, I, I split my curriculum in three directions. Yeah. You know, I, I call it the three branches. Uh, you know, the first branch being in Asano Kali. That's, that's a foundation because okay. in Asano Kali um, provides such a great base for universal movement. Mm. When I say universal movement, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a stick or an ax or a sword or a knife or a hand or a sock filled with ball bearings, you know, whatever it is like, the movement, the movements, the movement, right? And you can apply multiple weapons to that. And then we, you know, I have a, I have a Balintawak concepts branch just from the different Balintawak systems I've, I've been able to touch on a little bit and share some of those ideas where the, where the movement of the weapon, the pro, somebody, the profile of the weapon determines the body mechanic. You know, like, like there are certain things you, you, you can't do with a stick that you can do with a sword and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? So the body mechanics and Balintawak change versus how they work with a sword. So the third element is we do what's called mixed bladed concepts, which are the things that like these only work with a blade. You know, if I took a palm stick and ran it across your throat, it wouldn't yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. But if I took a knife and did it with the same amount of pressure, that would change the game. Yeah. And so, you know, that's kind of how we break that up. And I am very grateful um, for that foundation I got from Guru because it, it really allowed me to explore the other two branches that we do in the curriculum. Um, so, you know, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be able to train other systems if it wasn't for the mm. okay. So, you know, those three, those three aspects come together. Um, we're really a, a big deal uh, as far as like my understanding of Filipino martial arts and the lens okay. that, that I see it through. Um, but I think I just want to end on, on just saying that I'm, I would not have that ability if it wasn't for an Asano Kali, in my opinion. And so awesome. I'm, really, I'm really grateful for, for the path I've walked. So, and thank no, you for a fun night of talking martial arts, man. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, I mean, no, I, I want to thank you for coming on and, uh, and all that. I appreciate it. I, I, don't take, I don't take for granted that people are just going to want to come on. So I, I, everybody that does, I'm very appreciative that they're willing to give their time and answer questions <laughs> so um but yeah i appreciate it and um hey you take care of yourself man you too thank you so much i appreciate yeah. it you know and uh all right man you be good all right bud take it easy take care all right that was a good one yeah on uh, many levels so uh who is next um uh, sunday fma school how to open a successful one. So we're going to have Ace, Guru Ace, and Dr. Tim Hartman. They both have very successful FMA schools, and they don't teach anything but FMA. And we're going to hear how they do it. So hopefully maybe that could ignite or give inspiration for somebody who maybe has been thinking about it but just has, hasn't done it yet. Uh, again, these two um, 
I, I think they've done an incredible job doing it. So if you were interested in hearing about that, tune in Sunday, 7 o'clock p.m., and that will be episode 259, Ace Ramirez and Dr. Tim Hartman, and showing and talking to folks uh, how it can be done, how it's not impossible. Currently, do you guys know, there's only five schools that just teach FMA, Apollo, Tim Apollo, Guru Ace, Dr. Tim Hartman, uh, Miguel, uh, California, and Mark Makita. Five. Now there could be more, um, but I'm, you know, but still under ten. You know, so obviously that could be greatly improved. All right, folks. Thanks to you those who tuned in, watched, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to FMA Discussion, where all our proceeds go to charity. So when you sign up and become uh, <clears throat> on this website, there. I'm sorry, website. Just on the YouTube channel, when you subscribe, it helps us give more money to charity. All right, folks, we'll see you next time.